Welcome to Archeo Ed, a podcast about ancient civilizations in the Americas. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnard and I've been an archaeologist all around the Americas for over 20 years now. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about ancient civilizations that I find interesting. Sometimes it'll be overviews, sometimes it'll be very in-depth information, basically anything I feel like talking about, because this is my podcast and I'm just having fun with it. I hope you enjoy it too. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and let's get started. Season 3, Episode 3, The Mogollon. I just led a trip through part of the Mogollon world, so it feels like this is a good time for a podcast about that little-known culture. But right off the bat, I feel the need to confront how we pronounce the name of this culture. I'd call it a debate, but it's really not. Everybody pronounces it Mogollon. You can hear the country twang in it, Mogollon. But the name of the culture was coined by Emil Howry in the 1920s, and he took it from the nearby Mogollon Mountains. The mountains were named after a Spanish governor of the area in the 1700s. His name was Juan Ignacio Flores Mogollon. I actually went out and found some old audio of how Howry spoke, and he had no hint of a southern accent, so it wasn't him. I guess living in Austin, Texas, this has become a bit of a pet peeve of mine. The college strip next to the University of Texas is Guadalupe Street, but everybody calls it Guadalupe. Another street is named after a Texas revolutionary hero named Antonio Menchaca, but we just call it Manchac. Anglicizing Spanish words is somehow claiming English language ownership over them, but I don't think it's right. So I don't care if people want to say Mogollon. That's not how the name is pronounced. It's Mogollon. There, I've drawn a line in the sand. And chances are I'll remain the only archaeologist on my side of it. Oh well. Last month, my group and I toured sites, museum collections, and met some of the top experts on Mogollon culture. We also went to the Alamo Gordo Shroud of Turin Museum and saw the world's largest pistachio, but that was off-topic then and here. I was intrigued to learn that now more than ever, Mogollon specialists see a strong, continuous connection between the Mogollon and Mesoamerica to the south. That Mesoamerican connection is going to kind of be an underlying theme of this podcast episode. But as usual, let me start off with explaining some of the basic facts about the Mogollon. There were three major culture groups in the ancient American Southwest. The Ancestral Pueblo, the Hohokam, and the Mogollon. The Fremont culture would probably be angry that I excluded them, but sorry guys, you're just too far north into Utah and you never embraced full-time corn farming. But even as I say that... I realize the same kind of argument could be leveled against the Mogollon. They're kind of fringe, and they never stopped heavily relying on hunting and gathering. And they also gave up living in pit houses quite late. In fact, up until the excavations of Emil Howry in the 1930s, archaeologists thought that the Mogollon were just kind of sloppy ancestral Pueblo who couldn't build nice room blocks. Howry straightened us out defining the Mogollon as existing from 200 to about 1450 CE and having a distinctly different history than the Hohokam to their west or the ancestral Pueblo to their north. By the way, if you watch my Great Courses lectures, I say Emil Howry's name there wrong. I say Emil. Howry's daughter saw it and emailed me graciously thanking me for honoring her father's work. She also politely told me that I was saying his name wrong. I couldn't change that, but I can do better here. So, I want to be clear, it's Emil, not Emil. Geographically, defining the Mogollon region is kind of frustrating, specifically because no two researchers seem to agree on it. 
everybody agrees that there's a Mogollon heartland in the southern part of New Mexico called the Mimbres Mogollon region. And everybody agrees that another group called the Hornada Mogollon lived to the east, from the Rio Grande to a place called Waco Tanks, just north of El Paso in Texas. It's how far the Mogollon culture spread into northern Mexico and Arizona that changes from map to map. Some archaeologists see it reaching deep into the Sonoran Desert and all the way across to the Gulf of California. Others are more conservative, but still see it as including the enigmatic ancient city of Pacime, which I'll get back to. Over in Arizona, late period Mogollon definitely moved there, but the questions are, for how long, and were they really still Mogollon, or were they some new thing called Salado culture? In any event, the Mimbres and the Hornada Mogollon are solid. That's where my recent trip went, and that's why I'll focus on them here, at least for the most part. Now, I don't want to bore you with a lengthy discussion of Mogollon chronological periods, but at least outlining the broad strokes is important. As the long archaic period wound down in the last centuries of the BCE period, pretty much everyone in the Southwest were what we call basket makers. We call them that because they made grass-weaved baskets for gathering. They lined a few of them with mud and managed to cook in them, too. Many people lived in rock shelters, and some made pit houses. Then about 2000 BCE, corn enters the region. All the earliest evidence is firmly in the Mogollon region, and this is the first time that contact with Mesoamerica is clear. Corn definitely came from the south. The funny thing is, no one seemed to care. They planted a bit, enough for archaeologists to find some burned corn cobs in dry caves, but they pretty much continued hunting and gathering. It wasn't until a second strain of corn showed up at about 100 BCE that people started actually farming it. By 200 CE, the Mogollon start to make pottery, a few hundred years before the neighboring cultures. Pottery tends to go hand in hand with an embracing of sedentary life and cooking corn. And the interesting thing is that the Mogollon pottery starts already looking pretty nice and sophisticated, not the kind of rudimentary stuff you'd see from a culture's first try. The theory is that the same Mesoamericans who brought the corn showed them how to make pottery, and that's connection number two for the Mogollon. Over the next couple hundred years, the Mogollon make bigger and better pit house villages, but when the ancestral Pueblo start building above-ground room blocks and the Hohokam start using irrigation canals, the Mogollon do neither. They do start building communal kivas, like the ancestral Pueblo, but they're rectangular, not circular. About 900 CE, the people in the Mimbres Valley start making beautiful black-on-white painted bowls, a subject that I'll talk more about in part two. But it was right about 1000 CE when the major changes happened to the Mogollon. They radically changed how they live and socially organize. As I just explained, around 700 CE, their neighbors to the north, the ancestral Pueblo, abandoned their pit houses in favor of above-ground room blocks. The Mogollon did not. But at 1000 CE, they decided to go with room blocks. They filled in their pit houses and burned and buried their rectangular kivas, and they built room blocks in the same places. That means that they went from individual families living in their own separate pit house to living in multi-family compounds, and that's a big deal. Add it to their intentional destruction of their communal kivas, and something radical happened. I should clarify here that this shift to room blocks happened all over the Mimbres region settlements, but not so much outside of that area just yet. So why did they do this? 
The simplistic answer is that they were influenced by the Pueblos to the north. After all, Chaco Canyon was in full swing by then and building roads in every direction. Maybe they got caught up in the Chaco phenomena. Well, there are things that don't match up with that idea. For one, circular kivas are signature architecture for Chacoan sites, but non-existent in the Mogollon Classic sites. For another, there was very little Pueblo pottery in the Membres Valley. In fact, the Membres brought their own pottery to new heights. When one culture is influencing another, socially or economically, pottery changes are virtually always the first indicators. It's logical to say that an improvement in the climate helped the Mogollon expand their communities. The same conditions were helping Chaco Canyon. But climactic conditions ended both eras as well, a terrible drought starting in 1130 CE. The ancestral Pueblo abandoned Chaco Canyon and went north into the spring-fed canyons of the San Juan Basin. As for the Mogollon, they too sought more perennial sources of water. Some moved east, making small farming villages in the flood plains of the Rio Grande River. Others followed the Gila River to the northwest, where mountain springs were still flowing. And that worked, at least for a while. The drought led up and people settled in. But then an even worse drought hit and lasted for a cruel 20 years, from basically 1279 to 1299. We call that the Great Drought. It pushed Mogollon climate refugees further north and ancestral Pueblo communities south. A big group of them, both cultures, met at a strong part of the Salt River in the mountains of Arizona. They built a surprisingly large community together called Grasshopper, a place that swelled to 500 room blocks in just a single generation. But that community didn't last either. As the rainfall once again returned, people spread out. By 1400, more purely Pueblo communities stretched north and eventually became the Hopi. The Mogollon moved south, making places like Gila cliff dwellings and re-inhabiting the Mimbres Valley. But for me and many archaeologists, the truly amazing community that sprang from the ashes of the Great Drought was Pakime. Pakime, called Casas Grandes by American archaeologists, was a massive community that started at about 1350 CE in Chihuahua, just a few hours south of the United States border into Mexico. It was a unique blend of cultures, part Mesoamerican and part Southwest. I'll talk more about it at the end of this podcast. For now, I'll just say that it was debated. Was the southwest half of Pequime Mogollon, or maybe Ancestral Pueblo, or something else entirely? Going all the way from Grasshopper to Pequime seemed too much geography, and there was little to indicate that the two places had a trade relationship. But when Steve Lexen found a Mogollon site in the Black Mountains that spanned the 1200s, that became the missing link archaeologists were looking for. The Black Mountains lie south of the Membres area, and Lexen's find gave rise to the idea that some Mogollon had been migrating south as well. That, in turn, fuels the general consensus I found talking to Mogollon experts last month. The idea that Pakime is not just a Mogollon site, but the last great expression of their civilization. Okay, so there's an overview of Mogollon chronology. I'll take my first commercial break here. And when I return, we'll talk about the thing that the Mogollon are most famous for, Mimre's pottery. Listeners of this podcast are probably most familiar with the Mayan population during their monumental building eras. Of course, the Mayan people are still with us. Many of them live in isolated locations in the interior of Guatemala. 
separated by economic and linguistic factors, they have little access to medical and surgical resources. Smiles for Guatemala consists of medical volunteers from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, assisted by non-medical volunteers, primarily Rotarians, from the Philadelphia region. The team travels to Guatemala on a regular basis to perform free, life-changing surgeries for facial and hand anomalies. For information on how you can contribute to future missions, please go to smilesforguatemala.org. This message is sponsored by a friend of Smiles for Guatemala. Okay, I'm back. Let's talk about what the Mogollon are most famous for. The black-on-white bowls collectively called Mimbre's pottery. Of all of the ancient pottery I've studied over the years, Mimbre's is definitely among my favorites. It's not the most sophisticated, in fact, it's all just simple bowl forms. It's not the most elaborate. It's just brownware pottery painted with a white slip and black lines. It's not even that pretty. Its style has often been called crude and even childlike. But it has a cartoonish, almost whimsical feel to it that always makes me smile. It seems like the artists want you to have fun looking at it. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, hit pause right now and Google Mimbre's Pottery. Chances are you'll say, oh yeah, I know that stuff. It really is world famous. But of course, it wasn't always famous. In fact, it sat lost to humanity for centuries, only to be rediscovered about a hundred years ago. After European contact, it was Spanish territory but no one tried to colonize the Mimbres Valley. In the 17th century, displaced Apache tribes moved into the area, but they couldn't have cared less about the ruins. Then finally, at the start of the 1900s, white settlers came to the valley. One such was E.D. Osborne, who bought the land around what's now known as the Old Town Ruins. While establishing his farmlands, he came upon Mogollon room blocks, and inside those he found burials. Most of those burials were people in a seated position with bowls on their heads and sometimes a few more at their feet. When he flipped the bowls over, he found their interiors were painted with black line images, some geometric, but others depicting animals and people. In 1914, he invited archaeologist Jesse Fuchs to come take a look. Fuchs immediately recognized its uniqueness and value. He excavated dozens of the bowls and published a volume in the 1920s. That immediately attracted other archaeologists, the most important of which was Alfred Kidder. Kidder found another pair of homesteaders digging up Membrae's bowls, Bert and Hattie Cosgrove. Impressed by Hattie's meticulous note-taking, he recommended the Cosgroves to Harvard, who hired them to excavate the Schwartz ruins. Over multiple field seasons, they dug up grave after grave, sending the pots to Harvard. All in all, they sent almost a thousand bowls. Hattie drew all the bowl images with an almost perfect accuracy. I say almost because she was a good Christian woman who decided not to reproduce the naughty bits. There's an amusing amount of penises missing from her drawings. Anyhow, Harvard's interest in Membrae's pottery was not entirely a good thing. Their interest attracted the eyes of antiquities traders and rich collectors. That, in turn, inspired looting. At first, it was just farmers with shovels. But by the 1960s, the value of Membrae's pottery bowls soared and looters began using backhoes. They would scrape the room blocks off entirely so they could easily find the burials. As a sad result, most of the big Membrae's Mogollon sites were completely destroyed. They would be probably 100% gone if not for Steve LeBlanc's establishment of the Membrae's Foundation in the 1970s. The foundation bought land, protected sites, 
and began an era of professional excavations in the Mimbres Valley. And thanks to their lobbying efforts, New Mexico passed strong burial protection laws in 1979. LeBlanc continues to be a force in Mogollon archaeology to this day, still hard at work expanding his amazing digital archive of Mimbres pottery. It's virtual, free for all to access, and currently contains over 10,500 vessels. It's called MIMPID, the Membrase Pottery Images Digital Database. I'll post a link to it in my show notes. But be warned, it's a rabbit hole. I've been sucked into it for hours. Anyway, that's a good segue into talking about Membrase imagery. It's amazingly evocative. Looking through the corpus, you just know it's telling all sorts of long-lost stories and mythic tales. These particular style of bowls were only made in the Mimbrace Valley, and it was rarely traded to the outside world. It was for and by the Mimbrace people. And though most all of it has been found in burials, it wasn't some kind of special made burial offering. It shows clear use wear. Microscopic analysis shows the evidence of food residues and places where spoons scraped its surface. To me, that really adds to its charm. Membrace people used it in life and brought it with them in death. Do any of you have a favorite bowl or a coffee cup? I bet it was kind of like that. Now, we can discern the themes painted on the bowls changed over the roughly 300 years it was produced. They started making it in the late 800s, and all the earliest stuff is geometric patterns. Then in the 900s, they began favoring animal images, all sorts of animals, but always just one kind of animal per bowl. For a while, I wondered if that could in have indicated some kind of clan affiliation, but multiple studies trying to match burial location or type failed to find any pattern. In fact, no kind of distribution pattern whatsoever has ever been found. That, I believe, has been correctly used to suggest that the Membre Society was very egalitarian. At about 1000 CE, the same time they made that major shift from pit houses to room blocks, the subject matter began including humans. The fact that they gave up their houses but not their pottery traditions really speaks to how core these bowls were to Membrace identity. Now, the geometric pieces are nice, but if I'm being totally honest, a lot of cultures painted geometric forms, and it's not terribly unique. But when most cultures paint animals or humans on pottery, they strive for a degree of realism, not the Membrace. Their depictions are purposely cartoonish. People who call them rudimentary or childish, I think, are missing the point. I strongly believe that the Membres were having fun with it. I can see a Membres artist finishing a piece and saying to their friends, Check out this cute rabbit. But that's not to say that they didn't include accurate details. Their jackrabbits, for example, have the black tips on their ears that denote their local species. And certain fish, despite their funny faces, have patterns that identify their species. That's how we know that they were traveling far from the valley. Certain depictions are clearly marine species from the Gulf of California. Other animals also prove up their far-flung trade relationships, especially scarlet macaws. Those are from the jungles of Mesoamerica, yet they're depicted on multiple Membrase bowls. In fact, actual macaws have been found in Membrase ruins. Just in the old town ruins alone, over 20 macaw skeletons have been found. And there we have yet another link to Mesoamerica, this time in the 10th century CE. And the timing makes sense because it was the terminal classic in Mesoamerica, a time of major population migrations all over the place. When it comes to the human depictions, there's even more talk of Mesoamerican connections of late. Clearly, there are depictions of religious ceremonies and mythic stories. 
But now there's a growing belief among Membrace researchers that there are elements of the Maya creation story, the Popol Vuh. In fact, every scholar I met last month thinks so. The El Paso Museum of Archaeology, which is amazing, by the way, has an entire exhibit arranging key pieces that show the Popol Vuh. There are clearly twin boys, and they're depicted doing things like slaying monsters, turning into fish, and getting decapitated. All of those are indeed parts of the Popol Vuh. But I, as a Mayanist who knows the Popol Vuh well, remain a bit skeptical. Important elements like the Grandmother, the Lords of Death, and especially the Mesoamerican ball game are missing. If my colleagues are right, and Membres did know the Popol Vuh, then it was an altered version. But hey, that might be exactly what one would expect in a game of telephone that took place across the Sonoran Desert. I should mention one other common and intriguing thing about Membres pottery, the kill holes. Many of the bowls recovered from the heads of the buried individuals have a hole punched into their base, an intentional destruction of the piece. All sorts of theories have been proposed as to why. Probably the most popular is the bowls represent the sky above and the hole is where the souls travel into it. I'm not really sure why they do it either, but I can say that the Maya practiced what we call termination rituals. They would intentionally partially destroy buildings, stela, and sometimes ceramic bowls. The theory there is that they are releasing the spirit of those objects. The idea is that they were ritually brought to life and that their life cycle required a death. And that line of reasoning reminds me of how, at the same time, Membres were ritually burning their kivas. The Hohokam and the ancestral Pueblo never did such things. Is that yet more evidence of the Mogollon Mesoamerican connection? Well, maybe. But to conclude this brief discussion of Membres pottery, here's what I'd like you to take away. So often, the artifact record is boring and obtuse. It's all about tools and construction methods and subsistence strategies. But Membrace pottery gives us this wonderful insight into the minds of the people who made and used it. You can see the fun they were having making it. It's clear that they had a sense of humor, and I love that. And it wasn't about economics or subsistence strategies. They didn't trade it outside the valley, which, by the way, only had about 6,000 people living in it. And it wasn't a status thing that only elites had access to. All sorts of people had it in their graves, and no identifiable class of people had more than others. They were a group of humans that liked art for art's sake, and who enjoyed expressing themselves through it. And I think that's why we modern people like it so much. It's because we see ourselves in it. Well, okay. So let's do the final commercial break here. When I return, we'll talk about who the Mogollon became after the Great Droughts. The Ancient Maya Calendar. I'm fascinated by it, and though I've been studying it for decades, I still learn new things about it all the time. I call it ancient, but I and literally millions of modern Maya people are still tracking it into modern time. Towards that end, I've created two products to help people better understand it. My annual Maya wall calendar and an iPhone app called simply Maya Calendar. Through these tools, you can figure out today's date or tomorrow's or a Maya date thousands of years in the past. The app will even calculate your Maya birthday and tell you about your personality traits and destiny according to modern Maya daykeeper priests. The Maya Calendar app is available through iTunes, but both it and my annual Maya wall calendar are available through my website, mayan-calendar.com. That's mayan with an n-calendar.com. Check it out. Well, 
dang, that was a compelling commercial, wasn't it? Anyway, let's get back to the Mogollon. Mogollon published chronology lumps a bunch of events into a final phase, though what we know now really calls for a refinement. In that final phase, two big drought episodes shook everything up. The first is 1130 through 1150 CE. The second is 1279 to 1299 CE. Both episodes caused major Mogollon migrations. It's easy to see what sites they abandoned, but harder to see exactly where they went. As we currently understand it, the Mogollon dispersed in three main directions. To the east, at the Rio Grande River, northwest up the Gila River, and south into northern Mexico and the Black Mountain sites that Steve Lexon found. Their reasons for doing so aren't hard to understand. Less rain made the places they were farming untenable, and they moved to more reliable sources of water, mostly the floodplains of larger rivers. The ones that went east joined the Hornada Mogollon, mostly in the Rio Grande's floodplains and the Tularosa Basin. And they went back to basics, small villages and increased reliance on hunting and gathering. They also went back to making petroglyphs. The Three Rivers Petroglyph site in the Tularosa Basin has an amazing 21,000 petroglyphs made by Hornada Mogollon during this period. Another, arguably largest group of Mogollon drought refugees moved northwest up the Gila River into the mountains of central Arizona. The Salt River crossed there too, giving them two areas of floodplains to utilize. We know a lot about the history of that region because, for whatever reasons, it was dug by various University of Arizona field schools for over 50 years. First, Howry led field schools at Point of Pines from 1947 to 1960, and then various directors led field schools at the site of Grasshopper for another 30 years, from 1963 to 1993. Both sites were huge compared to previous Mogollon settlements. Point of Pines had 800 rooms, and Grasshopper had 500, and each had multiple satellite villages with hundreds more. The reason those sites got so big is neat. It's because not only Mogollon people moved there. Climate refugees from the Hohokam and Pueblo cultures also moved there. It was likely the ancestral Pueblo migrants, fresh off the huge construction projects of the Chaco period, who brought the idea of very large Pueblos. But the Mogollon were clearly there too, best evidenced by the pottery types. While it wasn't the Mimbrace type anymore, its painting style and focus on bowls was clearly Mogollon. A type called Salado pottery is almost certainly Mimbrace inspired. To my mind, it's kind of a touching moment in Southwestern history. People put aside their cultural differences and lived peacefully together helping each other through tough times. Point of Pines emerged first, about 1200 CE, and steadily grew for 200 years. Grasshopper coalesced at about 1300 CE, right after the second drought. It grew to a height of 500 room blocks in just a single generation. But by 1400, the entire region cleared out. Some moved further northwest into what's now Hopi territory. Others moved south, back into the Membrés region and as far south as northern Mexico. It's that group that moved south into Mexico that really captivates my imagination. A few hours south of the modern Mexican border lies the amazing ruins of Paquime, also called Casas Grandes. Basically, the American archaeologists call it Casas Grandes, and the Mexican archaeologists call it Paquime. As I see it, it's in Mexico, so they get the right to name it, and hence, I call it Paquime. 
Whatever you call it, it's one of the most bizarre archaeological sites that I know of. In its final form, it had a walled water channel running through the middle of it. The eastern half is very southwest, adobe brick, multi-story room blocks. But the western half is very different and very Mesoamerican. It has I-shaped ball courts, pyramids, and stone-built structures. It also has sacrificial victims buried under its architecture. The Southwest cultures never did that. It's not a perfect line of demarcation between the two cultures. There are room blocks on the Mesoamerican side and macaw breeding pens on the Southwest side. But it's also definitely not a homogeneous blend of the two. And it's not a tiny outpost either. There are over 2,000 room blocks. Population estimates run from an unlikely 2,500 people to upwards of 10,000. For decades, Mogollon involvement in the creation of Pakime was discounted. And almost all of that was driven by the site's first professional archaeologist, Charles de Pesso. Now, I don't mean to smack talk de Pesso. He was a student of Howry's and an excellent archaeologist. His notes have an impressive amount of detail. It was just that he was wrong. Smart people can be wrong, too. It happens all the time. After multiple field seasons in the 1960s, de Pesso's conclusion was that Pakime was a Mesoamerican-controlled trading outpost and that their primary client was Chaco Canyon. A major problem de Pesso didn't know that he had was his dendrochronology. It was off by almost 150 years. A later refinement of the tree ring signatures for that far south made a Chaco connection impossible. The current understanding of Pakime's history goes like this. Just after 1130, Pakime grows a bit larger than the other sites in the immediate region, sites that were already culturally Mogollon. That date very cleanly matches the drought-driven abandonment of the Mimbres Valley. Then, just before 1350, the site is dramatically burned and the construction of the half-and-half -half site starts. That matches up nicely with the depopulation of the sites of Point of Pines and Grasshopper. Maybe some of those people moved to Pakime? Supporting that point is the fact that Pakime's late pottery looks a lot like the Mimbres-inspired Salado pottery. Now, admittedly, I'm not a ceramicist. But when just last month I mentioned that similarity to Dr. Cynthia Bettison, director of the fabulous Western New Mexico University Museum, she agreed. She, like most Mogollon experts today, also believes that Pakime is a Mogollon site. And that's a big deal. It elevates the Mogollon from a culture who made what Howry referred to as expedient Pueblo architecture, to a major player in regional trade and political power. It also connects them, once again, strongly to Mesoamerica, more so than the Hohokam or the ancestral Pueblo ever were. Now this is non sequitur, but I have to mention the strangest thing about Pakime. In the 1860s, a group of treasure hunters led by the director of the Chihuahua Mint, Enrique Mueller, were digging rooms deep inside the Pueblo when they encountered a 5,000-pound meteorite. Their description, and it may not be the truth, is that it was enshrined, covered in cloth, and sealed inside a brick box. They hauled it to El Paso. Eventually, the Smithsonian bought it off them, and it was sent to Washington, D.C. by train. And it's still there. It's on display at the Smithsonian as I say this. I understand the Smithsonian's interest in it, but what did it mean to the Mogollon? Where did it come from? And how did they move a 5,000-pound meteorite? That was a huge effort. I don't have any answers. All I can say is that I love it. So, back to Pakime itself. It was abandoned sometime around 1450. 
It went out not with a bang, but an apparent whimper. De Pesso's excavations found that city maintenance slowly ground to a halt. Buildings ceased to be maintenanced. The central water channel silted in and became polluted. Rotted animal corpses line its base by the end. So where did the Mogollon go? Well, probably nowhere. Likely they dispersed into smaller communities and melded into Pueblo communities to the north. Then when the Spanish came, many died of disease and the survivors' descendants became mestizos. Today, we have the potential of DNA studies. It's possible to sequence DNA from Mogollon burials and then compare it to modern populations. I've been scanning the new publications as best as I can, but have yet to see any studies along those lines. If any of you listeners know of some, please let me know. I did see one little mention in a 2017 issue of Archaeology Southwest magazine. A paper there with Daryl Creel as the lead author has a single sentence. It says, DNA studies in the Mimbres area show a strong link to northern Mexico, especially to the Tarahumara and Huichol peoples. And there, once again, is evidence connecting the Mogollon to Mesoamerica. Well, like most topics, I have a lot more to say about the Mogollon, but I best leave it here. I'll wrap up this episode by simply saying, the Mogollon deserve more respect than they currently get. You should go to Silver City, stay at the historic Murray Hotel, and explore what's left of the Mimbres Valley. It's amazing. Until next month, this is Ed, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, produced, and distributed by me, Ed Barnhart. If you liked what you heard, then subscribe, like, share, comment, and do all those other things that I'm supposed to ask you to do. If you didn't, then don't do any of that stuff. And if you really liked it, support ArcheoEd through my Patreon account. I make these podcasts for free, but I am not opposed to financial support. Until next time, thanks for listening. All rights reserved. Copyright 2020.